Hey, you guys, it's Rory here from BOA Online, and uh, <clears throat> glad you could make it tonight. Uh, if you're on with me, awesome. If you're not, catch me after this in the, in the replays. But uh, yeah, big fan of the Goonies <clears throat> as, as a kid, and even now as a big kid with, uh, with my littles. And just thought I'd throw in a little uh, personal tidbit there. What do you guys think of the Goonies? Oh, those are epic. They don't make movies like those anymore. But uh, <clears throat> Goonies is not why we're here tonight. Um, we want to talk about uh, the, the most important thing about B season, really, is have you planned for harvest time, right? I mean, <clears throat> have, you got it? have you got it down? Do you know what the bees are doing? Because they're not waiting, okay? <clears throat> they are not waiting for us. They are action-based insects right now, and it's their peak season. So we need to be on the ball. And I'm going to talk to you quickly about how to go about that, all right? There's three action steps you need to be taking. But this is what the bees are doing now. We'll get to the action steps in, in a little bit. So just <clears throat> let's go through them. Um, bees are doing number one. What are they doing? They're pollinating anything that flowers in your area, okay? Small bee, bee colonies that are <clears throat> less than five frames uh, at the moment are traveling up to 750 meters away in diameter from the hive, from the colony. And uh, bees that have up to 10 frames in the, in, in the, in the brew box, they're going to be traveling much further. They can travel. They, they enjoy a, 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 a radius or diameter of up to 1.25 kilometers. <clears throat> any bee colony can go further than that. They can travel. Any, any bee forager can go up to five kilometers away. But I'm talking about an optimum point at this stage uh, uh, for, for uh, efficiency. Okay. So in other words, it means that a colony that's large, it's got a, a huge amount of, of foragers, they will, they will utilize up to 1.25 kilometers efficiently within the diameter of the, of the colony. And uh, that means going that far and back and having still an excess of nectar overall, as far as the numbers go in the hive. Uh, excuse, my, excuse my throat. I've just been... Uh, <clears throat> I'm still experiencing a bit of a flu at the moment, and uh, it's nasty. It's got a bit of a mm, in the throat, a bit of a frog in the throat. <clears throat> anyway, so that's number one. What, what else are bees doing? Second thing <clears throat> that bees are doing right now is they're foraging the heck out of anything flowering at the moment. So not only pollinating, in other words, they're collecting pollen and pollinating, in other words, transferring their pollen from one plant to another, one flower to another. They're also foraging nectar. Now, those two things are different. A lot of people have a misnomer that pollen is what makes honey and that when bees are pollinating uh, flowers, it means they're making honey and they're making honey from the pollen, which is not correct. Uh, the correct way uh, is or how it happens. It happens to be that uh, bees collect pollen and that's not the same as nectar. Nectar is the carbs, pollen is the uh, proteins and they need both to survive. <clears throat> and they need both to produce honey as well as young. So uh, cool. So you're with me at the moment. They're pollinating all sorts of flowers, anything that's growing in, in, in the vicinity of 1.25 kilometers efficiently. <clears throat> and they're foraging from anything in that same zone. Now, they, how do they go about doing that? Well, they can decide pretty much uh, based on the quality of that pollen and, <clears throat> and nectar nectar that's available within that zone, that impact zone, okay, and they do that by, by instinct. They, they can know, they, they can tell, and they tell their friends. They go back to the hive, they do the little waggle dance that we all know and love. If you're not sure about that, Google it. Um, we talk a little bit about it in some of our early videos about how the waggle works or how research has shown how the waggle works and what direction it means when, some, when, a, when a bee is showing direction and distance and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> And also what kind of resource it is. It could be water, it could be nectar, it could be pollen, or could even be uh, tree sap and so on for, for uh, propolis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so those are the two things. So the third thing that they're doing at the moment is producing honey, okay? And they're producing young, all right? So those, three, those, those are the major things that you're busy doing right now. Why is this vital for you? Well, the impact that it has for you is essentially that, uh, oh, welcome, whoever's joined us, awesome to have you on board. If you have questions, pop them in the chat below, okay? <clears throat> the impact that it has for you as a beekeeper, right, is that if you're not prepared, the bees are going to abscond. Uh, at the least, they're going to split, okay? And what does this mean? This means that your overall production <clears throat> drops. It, mean, it means that you have less bees 
in the colony, which means there's less forages, less honey production, less of everything, okay? It is a natural process. So when bees abscond or when they split, especially at this point in time, they're more, most likely going to split and not abscond, then you're going to end up with a situation where, um, as I say, the, the impact on that is that you, ha you have less production of honey, less bees in your colony, and uh, it's likely that they're not going to just split once, okay, if you're not managing your bees properly. So <clears throat> what happens is that you need to be making sure that you are harvesting your colonies, you're inspecting the colonies properly, and that you, replace, you are providing them with enough uh, brood space as well as enough super space to keep the honey that they're harvesting right now because they're going crazy, okay, they're going moggy. <clears throat> so why you have to act, okay? Harvesting, extracting honey takes planning. It's messy. It requires specific tools, and they're all kinds of tools for all kinds of budgets. Note that your bees will be excessively aggressive during honey season, especially when you start taking honey off of them, and they're full, and they're hot, and they're bothered. <clears throat> and they're at full capacity population wise. Uh, that can all lead to a uh, lead from a uh, poor management. Okay. Um, note that smoking and super chamber handling can be utilized properly to lower their reactionary levels. <clears throat> to find out more, you can check out how we walk you guys through this and I'll start beekeeping academy. Okay. Uh, the second thing that you have, the issue that you have is filtering and bottling of honey. So once you're ready, once you actually know that your bees have got honey and you can smell it, that beautiful scent, that it's just like, it, it, it's just alluring. It's almost like having a, uh, what do you call it, a uh, siren, you know, for the sailors, it calls to the beekeepers, you know. It calls to anything really, including badgers and ants. So, you know, it's not surprising that it's beautiful, right? It's just that smell of honey. You can smell it meters and meters away from the hive. It's beautiful. <clears throat> and, it's, and the promise of it is alluring. So we want to get in there. We want to make sure that you are able to, once you harvest the actual supers or super frames, <clears throat> you ideally you should be taking them away, shaking them off, taking them away to your bucky or to your vehicle that you have, and then sealing it up over there to take back to your house or to wherever you process your honey. You can bring it to, to the beware shop in Centurion. We have a honey processing facility there now and a, bottling, and a bottling one as well. But if you're taking it to your home, there's a number of budgets that you can use in order to do that. <clears throat> you can use double strainers, pantyhose, cheesecloths. They all work well. You filter the honey in the beginning. <laughs> yes, I did say pantyhose. Please make sure they're clean and they're new. Don't use, you know, I think that speaks for itself. And uh, <clears throat> cheesecloth, same thing. Um, and then there's a number of other things that you can be using that go with your filtering and or uh, bottling, okay? But essentially, the third action that you're going to need to do is marketing your honey <clears throat> uh, with labels and putting those in jars. Labeling is regulation is a thing, okay? And pricing and selling your honey uh, is, is an important factor of this whole experience, right? Even if you're doing it as a passionate, as a passionate thing, which is how I started out, and you're not really interested in the business side of this, it's still required. <clears throat> it's still a requirement. You know, bottling is still going to be a requirement. You should be packaging. It doesn't matter. Even if you give away the product, okay, the honey at the end of the day, you should be labeling it because there's there are labor regulations out around this, and it's not a choice. It's not expensive to go get 20 labels done down a jetline or something like that. Um, so how do you act? What's the action plan here? Colonies are in full expansion mode in the southern hemisphere right now. <clears throat> action number one is have a budget set aside for your best option to extract the honey. If you don't have a budget, well, the beauty, beauty about uh, beekeeping is that there are options for you. You can come through to one of our our, our shop in, in Centurion. We can extract stuff for you. We put it through an hour extract. We wait before you get there. We, we extract the stuff <clears throat> for you. We then can even bottle it for you or put it into buckets for you. You can take the buckets away and bottle it yourself. Um, so there is a set fee for that. And we aren't the only people that also provide this kind of service, but they are, we do do a honey processing facility option at, at the moment. Small beekeepers, if you're new, you're brand new, you don't have a big budget. Um, you, you, some people do like using electric honey spinners, four, eight, four, eight and 12 frame extractors. Obviously the budget there expands from uh, low to pretty high. Medium to large beekeepers, best, best ability is using multiple electric extractors of 12 frames or even a 24 frame ones when you have stock with a honey pump, a bottling machine, and a bottling facility, or alternatively, you can use our bottling facility. <clears throat> if you're interested in not using an extractor or you don't have the budget for that, then there's also the wax, the manual wax press. 
um, you can make one of these something similar to this yourself at home. And if you're really strapped for cash, you can use a uh, the drip tray, um, the drip tray method, which is in the blue book. And essentially, that's uncapping uncapping one side of the frame and laying it at a 45 degree angle with a tray underneath that in a warm environment that's sealed from the outside. So there's no bugs, and bees going to find it, whatever case is. It needs to be hygienic, obviously. <clears throat> and if it's warm and heated, if the room is, if the temperature, the ambient temperature in the room is pretty high, and I'm talking like 30 degrees, uh, then the honey will drip out overnight, okay, or during the day, whichever. But please make sure that the area is hygienic. And uh, the environment will be uh, need to need to be hygienic as well. And that is a very lengthy process. It'll take like days and days in order to get like a super chamber of ten frames done like that. Because you got one side, then you get the other side to do. But it's a low budget option. Alternatively, you can just take cheesecloth and crush the honey into a bucket. You're going to lose the comb <clears throat> and potential production time, but it's low budget, and you can repurpose the wax by making uh, your own wax sheets out of that, flat wax sheets out of that, if you be interested in doing that sort of thing too. Always a budget, always a way. <clears throat> Action number two is process journey with these options. As I said, double strain it using a stainless steel strainer, filter with a virgin unused pantyhose cheesecloth, uh, let it settle in a stainless steel settling tank with airtight sealing lids, ideally, or you can use virgin buckets. <clears throat> honey should rest overnight to allow rest overnight. Uh, that's why we call them settling tanks. We allow the honey to settle. And the reason why that happens is to allow the impurities to float to the top and air bubbles to escape as well. So then you can scrape them off with a spoon <clears throat> and, uh, and or a paper towel. If you lay a paper towel or plastic down on it and lift it up pretty quickly, it'll pick up all the, all the broken wax and impurities and whatever the case is in there. You can strain again if you like or put it into hot water. Etc. Honey pumps can be used to move your honey in bulk from buckets and tanks to larger uh, containers or other airtight containers as you see fit, and or also to be used in uh, bottling processes, which leads me to the final step here and the final action, <clears throat> which is bottling, labeling your liquid gold. Bottling is important for pricing, packaging, and your market. Okay, ideally you want to have a hygienic scenario and environment, uh, depending on how you bottle. A, you can also make a higher margin on your on your product and your pricing. Your packaging is going to have an impact on that. You know, if you've got a lush design on there, if it looks fantastic and it has a story and it tells about what you're doing and your passion around beekeeping and support of the bees, then you're going to have a different market that you're going to be able to uh, <clears throat> you know sell to and 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 appeal to, and therefore have a different price range as well, a price a price level a price point. So, and again, let me just reiterate, labeling is not a choice. It is a legal requirement, absolute stipulations. There is an old chapter of this in the blue book. Uh, things have changed a little bit since then, but we also have it covered in our online uh, beekeeping academy at www.startbeekeeping.co.za. Um, honey bottling facilities provide services in bulk or for custom. You know, It doesn't matter if you've got 10 frames or if you've got 10,000 frames. Uh, you know, there will be a, a honey bottling facility, um, at least I would think in some of the major cities. We've got ours in Centurion, <clears throat> and uh, there's likely to be one or two in Cape Town as well. How small or large a, a customer they're going to service, I can't tell you, but we will service anybody that comes in with 10 frames, for example. Um, honey bottling machines for medium to large producers are available. <clears throat> Usually these are available on um, available to order. Or on back order, uh, we do supply these through the shop too in Centurion. So uh, that's it for today, guys. That's pretty much going to cover what your bees are up to right now. They go in moggy over honey and pollen. Uh, another thing that you might want to throw into the mix of things, this is a little bonus tip that I should have mentioned in the beginning. But if you I see somebody's come, somebody's, I don't know if you're the same person that stayed with me all the way along or not, but cool. Thanks for hanging into the end because you're going to get to see the, you know, hear the bonus tip here too. Um, which is pollen, okay? So, so <clears throat> my main focus up until now has been talking about uh, all the nectar. You know, the nectar. I mentioned the pollen, but we didn't talk about how to harvest the pollen in the beginning. <clears throat> and there is a way, and there is a market uh, for pollen, okay? So it does have to be managed pretty quickly because it can degrade fairly quickly without having uh, without having been um, actually returned to the hive. Uh, so you have to be careful about how you manage it once you actually harvest uh, pollen. 
but it's not too difficult to do that. Uh, uh, you can freeze it, um, but you can get a pollen trap, okay? And uh, we've got those at the shop. They go on the front of the hive, and when the bees come back, obviously you don't want to do this 24-7, 365. You wouldn't be able to do it anyway, but you do need to allow your bees to have pollen in order to produce young and to survive because they need proteins. All of them need proteins. It doesn't matter if it's the queen or it's the drones or whatever. <clears throat> they all need to survive. They all need to sustain themselves by eating some pollen, okay, their protein. But in particular, they need it for the young. So what you would do is you put it on for a few days and you take it off for a few days, put it on for a few days, take it off for a few days, and then you will collect enough pollen that you can either reintroduce over the winter period if you are they have a dearth period for pollen, or you could now take that pollen and repurpose it <clears throat> into another product or another type of product. A lot of endurance racers, runners, a lot of the um, wakelifters, uh, uh, they all, they, they eat pollen as, as a um, high protein source. It's a high quality protein source, high impact protein as well. And obviously it's natural. So, and it's non-meat based, which is awesome for vegetarians as well. Um, so, <clears throat> cool. Awesome. Uh, so we, we've covered pretty much, I think, what we need to in terms of what you might need to do, what you should be focusing on right now with regards to what your bees are doing and have you budgeted for your uh, honey harvesting and if you're busy doing the actions that we're taking that, that we talked about tonight. Um, so just to recap, guys, thanks for joining me and uh, look forward. Thanks for bringing us to 500 subs. That's awesome. Our next goal is going to be 1,000 subs. So talk to friends, share the videos, post them where you want to. <clears throat> uh, Leave me comments in the in the in the comment section below, okay, below in the video. I'll get back to you if I can. I'll make new motive, new videos as much as I can when I get a when I get a chance to. But uh, oh, I was gonna say, um, make sure that you've got spare supers too, because the bees are, are so prolific at the moment that every time you go to your hive, you should be taking spare super with you at the at the absolute least. You should be having a spare super with you. Because if you then discover during an inspection that your bees are full and that you need to harvest, you should be replacing that full that full super with a with an empty one, so that uh, even if you're away for a couple of days, in the meantime, the bees don't feel like they're overpopulated in a much smaller space now, and that could lead kick them off into a splitting situation. Okay, so we want to avoid that too. And uh, you could alternatively, instead of taking away this the, the full super, if you if you prefer, <clears throat> you could just put the new super on top of the old one and then they will move up uh, without obviously a queen exclusive between those two things, uh, between the two super chambers. They will start moving up and rebuilding, uh, start, sorry, drawing out the comb in the brand new super. And ideally here you should be using, in my opinion, I never really used to do this in the beginning, but I do understand and, and I recommend that people use wax sheets in the super chambers just because it does kickstart the, um, the bees uh, being able to draw out the cells and fill them up super fast over this period. In fact, you could get a <clears throat> a super with full wax wax uh, foundation sheets in it uh, with a production quality swarm. In other words, you've got eight frames in the brood chamber that are drawn out and that has uh, larvae in it, okay, or comb in it, babies, and that colony could literally draw out the honeycomb, the super, and uh, fill it within ten days if there's an equiflow. So it's, it, it warrants investing the amount it's going to take, the funds it's going to take to put in a wax sheet, a full, uh, a full super sheet in there. And basically what you could do is you could buy, you know, you, you could buy five uh, brood sheets and you cut them in half and that pretty much covers you for supers, okay, for super frames. So you get five wax sheets, for example, give you t uh, a 10 frames worth of, super, of uh, super foundation sheets, all right? Cool, so there's another tip for you guys coming to the end. Hope, hope to see you around on the uh, on the community section. YouTube's now updated everybody that you can get a community section, so that's gonna be cool. We're gonna be looking into how we can use that more as well. And we look forward to the next 500 subs and beyond. All the best guys, let's keep being ambassadors for our, our, our little handmaidens of nature. And uh, if you've got any more questions, as I say, pop them down in the chat. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Ciao for now. Work out. Bye.